build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire. Win this nation back. Change the atmosphere. Build your kingdom here. We pray. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now.
welcome to Cumna Parish and our service of morning worship as we join together to praise and worship God, to hear his word, and to pray that he will comfort us, strengthen us, and guide us in the days ahead. Jonathan is our preacher, and we will be reflecting on the words of Jesus in John 12. Next Sunday, I'm happy to say that we will be able to gather here for Palm Sunday at St. Michael's at 10.30, and you will be very welcome to join us. Also, the church will be open next week on Tuesday instead of Monday for the National Day of Reflection, as we remember and pray for those who have lo we have lost through this time of pandemic, those who have been bereaved, and those who have been sadly affected. And there'll be more details of that on the church website. And now we turn to our service. Jesus said, whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Lord, speak to us that we may hear your word. Move among us, that we may behold your glory. Receive our prayers, that we may learn to trust you. Amen. And our first hymn is, And Can It Be?
And so we come to a time of confession. Jesus said, those who walk in the dark do not know where they are going. Put your trust in the light while you have it, so that you may become children of light. When the Lord comes, he will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Therefore, in the light of Christ, let us confess our sins. And we say together, Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in his goodness, and keep us in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the prayer for today. Most merciful God, who by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, delivered and saved the world. Grant that by faith in him who suffered on the cross, we may triumph in the power of his victory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now we have our reading, read by Jeff and Joy Dorr, and then Jonathan will be preaching. Some Greeks seek Jesus. Some Greeks were among those who had gone to Jerusalem to worship during the festival. They went to Philip. He was from Bethsaida in Galilee and said, Sir, we want to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew and the two of them went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them. The hour has now come for the Son of Man to receive great glory. I'm telling you the truth. A grain of wheat remains no more than a single grain unless it is dropped into the ground and dies. If it does die, then it produces many grains. Those who love their own life will lose it. Those who hate their own life in this world will keep it for life eternal. Whoever wants to serve me must follow me so that my servant will be with me where I am and my Father will honour anyone who serves me. Jesus speaks about his death. Now is my heart troubled. And what shall I say? Shall I say, Father, do not let this hour come upon me? But that is why I came, so that I might go through this hour of suffering. Father, bring glory to your name. Then a voice spoke from heaven. I have brought glory to it, and I will do so again. The crowd standing there heard the voice, and some of them said it was thunder, while others said an angel spoke to him. But Jesus said to them, it was not for my sake that this voice spoke, but for yours. Now is the time for this world to be judged. Now the ruler of this world will be overthrown. 
When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to me. In saying this, he indicated the kind of death he was going to suffer. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The author, Robert Fulgham, tells this story of one of his professors, a wise man whose name was Alexander Papadaras. At the last session on the last morning of a two-week seminar on Greek culture, Dr. Papadaras turned and made the ritual gesture are there any questions? Quiet quilted the room. These two weeks had generated enough questions for a lifetime, but for now there was only silence. No questions? Papadaras swept the room with his eyes. So I asked, Dr. Papadaras, what is the meaning of life? The usual laughter followed, and people stirred to go. Papadaras held up his hand and stilled the room and looked at me for a long time, asking with his eyes if I was serious, and seeing from my eyes that I was. I will answer your question. Taking his wallet out of his hip pocket, he fished into a leather bifold and brought out a very small round mirror about the size of a, uh, about the size of a 20p piece. And what he said went something like this. When I was a small child during the war, we were very poor and we lived in a remote village. One day on the road, I found the broken pieces of a mirror. A German motorcycle had been wrecked in that place. I tried to find all the pieces and put them together, but it was not possible. So I kept only the largest piece, this one. And by scratching it on a stone, I made it round. I began to play with it as a toy and became fascinated by the fact that I could reflect light into dark places where the sun would never shine, in deep holes and crevices and dark closets. It became a game for me to get light into the most inaccessible places I could find. I kept the little mirror, and as I went about my growing up, I would take it out in idle moments and continue the challenge of the game. As I became a man, I grew to understand that this was not just a child's game, but a metaphor for what I might do with my life. I came to understand that I am not the light or the source of light, but light, truth, understanding, knowledge is there, and it will only shine in many dark places if I reflect it. I'm a fragment of a mirror whose whole design and shape I do not know. Nevertheless, with what I have, I can reflect light into the dark places of this world, into the black places in the hearts of men, and change some things in some people. Perhaps others may see and do likewise. This is what I am about. This is the meaning of life. And then he took his small mirror and holding it carefully, caught the bright rays of daylight streaming through the window and reflected them onto my face and onto my hands folded on the desk. In today's reading, some Greeks were drawn to the light that they saw in Jesus, the light of the world. We don't know quite what they've responded to. Was it the light he shone into the darkness of the Bethany tomb in raising Lazarus from the dead? Was it the light he brought into the city of Jerusalem, riding in on a donkey in triumph? like the sun rising and scattering gloomy clouds as God's coming King and Messiah? Was it the light he brought into the temple, clearing the courts of the Gentiles, of money changers and pigeon sellers, so that the Greeks could once more draw near to God's presence in worship once more? We don't know why. And actually, as we read the passage, we find that John who wrote it, is a lot more excited about the fact that they came than in telling us what happened when they met Jesus, if indeed they did meet Jesus, because we don't know. What we do know is that for Jesus, this was a significant moment. 
In John, we read nine times in all of it being of, of a mention of Jesus' time or Jesus' hour. Before this one, we read three times that Jesus' time or hour has not yet come. But this fourth occasion is a watershed. From now on, the hour has come. Now is the time. But for what? We're told. We're told it's for the Son of Man to be glorified. Jesus explains what this means. I tell you the truth. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Jesus' glorification then is his death. Just as a kernel of wheat dies when it's planted, but then produces many seeds as it sprouts and the plant grows to maturity, so too Jesus will die, did die. The effects of his death were to be a vast harvest of people who, through faith in him, would find a life-giving relationship with the living God. The coming of the Greeks seems to excite Jesus at the thought of this great harvest that would begin at Pentecost and continues even today. You know, there are more Christians in the world today than there have ever been before. The average Anglican these days even is an African woman in her early 30s. The harvest that is our purpose and our commission as we follow Jesus' call to take the gospel to the ends of the earth and make disciples of all nations means we have a lot of work to do. The hour then was the hour of his death followed by his resurrection and his exaltation. That was when the Son of Man would be glorified. And Jesus continued, he said, uh, saying that his life, sorry, his death and resurrection is our pattern for living. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Now love and hate there are extreme language he's using to make a point. It's not that God is cruel and if you don't like living, then he'll give you a lot more of it to punish you. It's not like that at all. He's saying if you don't hate it in comparison to what you're going to gain, him. We only get to keep what we give away. If we live for ourselves, we'll be miserable now and we'll throw away eternity. But if we give our lives away, laying them down in love for God, and other people, then what we get is that real kind of life, the eternal kind of life that starts now and continues on into forever, in infinite and ever-increasing joy. And that's what our following Jesus together is all about, reflecting God's light to those around us, so that together we can shine light into dark places. These Greeks saw something in Jesus. They drew near, asking Philip if they could see him. Now, Philip's a Gentile name, a Greek name. He perhaps was the most approachable to them, the most like them. We're told he came from Bethsaida in Galilee, which was an area where Jews and Gentile populations lived close together. Philip asked Andrew, another Greek name, uh, also from Bethsaida, and together they went to see Jesus. You see, this following of Jesus is all about relationship. It's all about relationship with God. It's all about relationships with one another. Love God and love other people as yourself. It's why online church isn't nearly as satisfying as gathering together. It's brilliant, isn't it, that we're going to be able to do that again from next weekend. It's not going to be as we want it to be because of the restrictions, because of the pandemic. But it's going to be a darn sight better than we can do at the moment. And as the restrictions are eased, we're going to be able to get back to something wonderful. Fellowship, communion, community together. Jesus died so that we could come into relationship with God. And as we come into that relationship, he pours his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And as he does that, we find that we have a new love for others too. We find the barriers between us starting to come down as well. If God loves each of us, then we must love each other as he has first loved us. You know, as we emerge from this pandemic, as we begin to rebuild from the ruins of 
our society. I don't think that's too dramatic a thing to say. As we begin to rebuild our lives from this time when we've been starved of relationship, when we've been separated physically from family and from friends, I have a hunch that deep relationships are going to be more important for church than ever before. Now, this is how churches grow. People come for all sorts of reasons, maybe curiosity, or an invitation from a friend, or to answer spiritual hunger. But do you know why they stay? They stay in a church where they find a quality of love that they haven't seen anywhere else. And in us, in our love, in our vibrant worship, in the honesty and reality of our prayers, in our joy, and in our patient suffering, they begin to catch a glimpse of Jesus. The only thing that ever really makes the gospel credible, the only thing that ever makes the gospel really believable, is a bunch of Christians who believe it and are trying to live it out. How can we be more that sort of church? Sir, we need to see Jesus. If you're one of our home group leaders, or you preach here, or, or even just when you're talking together with others, my encouragement is this. Be pointing one another always to Jesus. Let's put him front and centre of everything that we do. Let's look to him and let him make us a Jesus-centred, gospel-shaped community. So that we, broken mirrors that we are, cracked and imperfect and fallen, can at least reflect his light into the darkness of this present cultural moment. Have you ever wondered what it is that makes you truly unique? I mean, you can point at fingerprints, uh, you can point at physical characteristics, but you know, more than that, the thing that makes each of us special, different, actually, I think, is our relationships, the connections that we have with other people. Each of us has different family, friends, neighbours, colleagues. God has put each of us in a different place, the nexus of a particular web of relationships. Different people we see out walking or in the shops or, or wherever. Uniquely placed we are by God to share the good news of his love with the people around us. It takes all of us to do this. We can't leave that up to you know, the people who are wearing dog collars or a few specialists because we don't have the relationships that you might have. It's up to all of us to share that love. It's up to all of us to tell that story in ways that are appropriate for us and right for the people we're dealing with. To hear their story, to tell our story, to make room for God's story, to light up the darkness with selfless acts of kindness and love so that they'll want to experience God's love for themselves. You know, I believe with all my heart that the deepest needs and longings of the human hearts only find their true answer in Jesus. We might be to quiet them for a while with other things. But Jesus is the only one who satisfies. His love is the only thing that gets deep down. And you know, deep down, everyone you've ever met is crying out, Sir, we want to see Jesus. Our calling to be that mirror, pointing them to him. It takes us dying to self and rising in him that they might get a glimpse of his extraordinary, life-giving love. May we pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the price you pay to bring us into relationship with God. Thank you that we can know him through you. Thank you that you pour your Holy Spirit into our hearts to fill us with the love that you have for us. Help us not to be stagnant ponds, but to have a flow of that love out to others. To love them with the love that you love us with so that all might die and all might get a glimpse of you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Thank you, Jonathan. Let's pause for a moment to think about the words that we've heard. And in in particular, that it could be our prayer that we want to see Jesus. And our next hymn continues this theme, I See the King of Glory.
And now we join together to affirm our faith. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And our intercessions this morning are led by Roger Long. Let us pray. In our reading this morning, Jesus was predicting his death and resurrection. And because of that sacrificial act, this day, we can pray through him, our ascended Saviour, to our Father in heaven, and our praying will not be in vain. God will listen. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for our broken world, a world fallen so far from the one that you intended. Lord, more than ever, we need your presence, your wisdom, and your Holy Spirit to encourage, strengthen, and inspire us. For each of us to resolve to reverse the downward trend, let us pray together and believe it is neither inevitable nor impossible. And if we would but turn to you and rediscover the right way, we shall indeed be saved. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Father God, we thank you for the gifts and talents that we are given. Help us to share them freely with those you bring us into contact with. Even with masks and social distancing, we can still do good things for one another. Lord, make us selfless in our actions and generous in our giving. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we thank you for those who teach, those who care for others, and those who keep essential services running. For teachers, we pray for protection, that they may be kept free from the virus by social distancing and fresh air. For nurses, doctors and care workers, we pray that through sensible precautions, PPE and vaccinations, they may to be kept safe. For farmers, postmen, women, supermarket workers, electricity and gas workers, delivery drivers, and others in essential roles, Father, give them the fortitude to carry on working and staying safe. Help us to help them by doing our bit, by sticking to the rules. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for your church, internationally, nationally and locally. Lord, you turned to Peter and said, You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Lord, pour out your Spirit in you and revive your church. May we take our stand in the battle that is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and powers of this dark world. We need, as St Paul reminds us, a helmet of salvation, a belt of truth, and a breastplate of righteousness. Then, together with the shield of faith and that two-edged sword of your spirit, Lord, we can take our stand. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our parish, our communities, and our neighbours. Lord, give us eyes to see the needs of others and the generosity of spirit to respond. For we do not respond alone, 
you promise to be with us and you give us that same spirit that Christ left with his first disciples until the work on earth is indeed done. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As winter turns to spring, we think of all the things that have changed in our lives, for good and bad, for those we've lost and for those we mourn, those who are left to pick up the pieces of lives shattered by illness, accident or deliberate act. Father God, we lift before you those that you bring to our mind and in a moment of quiet we lift them to you. Great God of mercy, have compassion on them and give us the comforting words that you would have us speak. May we, in thought and word and deed, be ministers of your grace, love, and peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. And we bring all our prayers together in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And we join in a closing prayer, a prayer that we can take with us into the coming week. In darkness and in light, in trouble and in joy, help us, Heavenly Father, to trust your love, to serve your purpose, and to praise your name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the blessing. May God, who from the death of sin raised us to new life in Christ, keep us from falling and set us in the presence of his glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us and with those we love and remain with us always. Amen. Lord, the light of your love is shining. Lord, the light of your love is shining In the midst of the darkness shining Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us Set us free by the truth you now bring
Christians on a Sunday is really important to me because it's building fellowship and it's building friendships and having support and church is the people it's not the building. Community is the most essential thing really. It's, it's what keeps you going on earth. Even in the Lord's Prayer, if you read in English, there are eight times when we have used we, us or our. There is no I, myself or mine. The fellowship. The when people gather together worshiping God, it's what God wants us to do, what Jesus said, asked of his disciples to do, and we, we, we gather together and worship God, and it, it's, it's God. I think it's important to be gathered together as a church, to hear from God's word, to celebrate the Eucharist, and to be sent out to change the world and to share God's love. It gives you the opportunity to share time with people who are grounded in the love of God ultimately. I love it. But also being a part of the church allows you to take your faith outside of the four walls of the building, speaking to other people about your own beliefs. We have a WhatsApp group for my church, my immediate friends, and we pray for each other through the week. But to actually see each other and connect with each other and worship together is incredibly important, I think. The Trinity is God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and that is a community in itself. And we as His children are meant to be that image as well, so a community for us is gathering together as well. Victorious, you 
rose again so glorious You chose the cross The sorrow that surrounded you was mine Yet not my will but yours be done you Because of Jesus, because of Jesus. 